This is an ST2 bottom end, 2001 model, and I'm putting a thousand crank in it and thousand pistons and thousand rods. It's a crank and rod set that came out of an engine back in the Moto One days. It was a, I think the last one of the last warranty jobs we ever did. It was a thousand SS that had run the big ends. I've had the crank sitting around for, oh, what's that make it? About 15 years now. And this ST2 came in for a um, some high comps and head work. And the owner asked me about balancing it. And I said, well, we wouldn't balance it unless the bottom end had to come apart because it's a lot of extra work to pull the bottom end apart just to balance a crank. And I said, the only reason you'd pull the bottom end apart is if the plug was coming out of the big end of the crank. But this is a 2001 model, so it should have a steel plug that's staked in from the factory and it won't be coming out, so we don't need to pull the bottom end apart. And of course, when I pulled the cylinders off, I could see that the plug was coming out of the big end of the crank. And this is one reason why I don't like staking the plugs in so much. It was staked in, but it wasn't Loctited. I always use the strongest Loctite I can find, which is the Worth Green, which is pretty much the same as the old Loctite 270, I think, which I'm not sure you can still get 270. 270's green in Loctite and uh, it's sort of super strength, it's, it's above 262, the red stuff. So, this ST2 crank, the plug coming out, filling the main bearings up with steel shavings and stuff, so this engine has got all the bottom end bearings done. Uh, the crank that we had was ground and we're using Toyota 4AGE big end shells. You can get those shells from ACL in their race series. And the race series just means that where the ends of the bearing are, where they come together on the part line of the rod, if the bearing is round, when you, the rod is used and it starts getting pulled oval, top dead center overlap, because at top dead center overlap, the piston's flying up and there's no gas pressure to restrain it. And that's when everything works its hardest and the big end of the rod ovals. And when the big end of the rod ovals, the sides get pulled in. And if the shell is actually round, then it will bind at the part lines as it goes oval. So race series shells have more clearance at the part lines than a normal shell as a general rule. That's sort of what makes them race shells. Um, but the rods have been resized. And the crank's been ground 0.25 undersize. And one advantage of the 1000 crank is that there's no big end plug. It's just a big hole. And that's great. The extra 3.5 millimeter stroke means that the pistons go up an extra 1.75 mil and down an extra 1.75 mil. And because we're using 1,000 pistons, the compression height on the 1,000 pistons, I had a look at the pistol website to see their specs for 900 pistons and 1,000 pistons, and the compression height on the 1,000 pistons is about 1.75 mil less than the 900s. So that made me think, okay, 1,000 pistons are shorter. The distance from the crank center line to the cylinder deck is probably about the same, so we'll give it a whirl. I haven't actually checked the piston to head clearance yet, but it looks pretty good. Uh, what I'm doing at the moment is just seeing what happens when the crank goes in and what hits what, and that's sort of the first step. When I first dropped the crank in the cases to shim it, I found that this edge of the web, and you can see possibly there's a bit of a shiny cut there, Took a little cut off it on the lathe, on the chamfer. That part of the crank rubbed here on the crankcases. And that lump there is the oil pump output feed to the oil filter. 
So I took a little bit out of that. It didn't want to go too far because it's, it's a high pressure oil passage, but that tiny little bit should be fine. And I took a little bit off the edge of the crank as well, just that chamfer there. It was sort of this outer edge that was the problem. So that was the first issue. Now I've put it together with the crank and the rods and the cylinders and everything. I've had the other case has been on. I wanted to check the timing shaft clearance. The timing shaft should be fine because the part number for the ST2 shaft is the same as the ST3. And the ST3 has this crank and actually has, has different rods. It has 916 rods, which are shorter. So I just wanted to check the clearance between the rod and the shaft because it's sort of usually here on the rod that gets closest to the shaft. But that seemed fine. But what was happening was the rod bolts for the vertical cylinder were hitting the crankcase down the bottom. I'll turn it over. I've got it assembled now with one side off just so you can see in there. It's nice to see what's happening. As it came down, as it came down, that rod bolt right there was just touching the cases in the bump around the bolt hole. And so I put the rod bolts in the lathe and took a millimetre off the end of them. Uh, because I always replace the rod bolts, the rod bolts I'm using here are just junk, effectively. They're not going to be reused. So you can see the clearance on it just there that is the problem. But with one mil taken off the end of the rod bolts, it was fine. So the next thing you sort of look at is, because it's a thousand crank and a thousand pistons and a thousand rods, you shouldn't have any issues with the pistons coming out of the bottom of the bore too far or the pistons hitting the crank at bottom dead centre. Sometimes you can get that when you're putting a longer stroke crank in something. You can see, I mean, the crank's not completely centred at the top because there's no other case on it, but everything's bolted up pretty tight, so you're pretty good. You can see the clearance here between the crank and the bottom of the cylinder, and then the piston comes out. The piston's not coming out that far. It's certainly like the pin's still way up here. So I, there's no issues with how far the piston comes out of the ball. And everything clears, which is nice. Sometimes if you, you know your, your rods start getting close to cylinders, you'll see cylinders with notches in the bottom of them, that sort of thing. But it all looks like it's working just fine now. And the the big end bolt clearance was sort of the only thing that became an issue just there. To give a visual on the timing shaft clearance, you can see how close the big end of the crank is to it. Just there, there'd probably be half a mil at most I would say. But it's all factory bits, so it's obviously what Ducati think is okay. So that makes me feel better if they're only giving things half a mil at most, then we shouldn't need too much clearance elsewhere. I did a test to measure the volume of the piston crown. And what you do when you do that, you see this piston, it's the thousand piston. It's got a crown on it, it also has valve cutouts and those two combined give the piston crown either a positive or negative volume. I needed to know what that was to work out what the compression ratio was. The original piston out of these, out of the ST2, has got a little bit of a dome on it, not much, and you don't really need much of a dome to make a fair bit of difference to the volume because it's so big, and you see the valve cutouts so this piston might have a, a overall dome volume close to zero by the time you measure those for negative and the little bit of dome for positive. The way we measure the piston dome volume, when you've got a dome piston like this, let's bring this one up a little bit, 
is work out where top dead center is. And because you can't put a flat sheet of perspex over this to seal it, you drop the piston down and I go 10 millimeters. So about, you know, there, probably about that 10 millimeters down. And then you fill that up with fluid, measure the volume. You know how big the hole would be because it's 94 millimeters by 10 millimeters. So you can, you can calculate that volume. And you subtract that volume from how much fluid you put in here. And that gives you the piston crown volume, whether it's positive or negative. I'll just show you the piece of perspex is still on the cylinder head over here, which is all clamped up. But I, I got a, this is the section here I used, four holes drilled in it, so you can put it down over the studs. I used to put a piece of bar across it to clamp it down nicely. No leaks, worked really well. But I made a mistake in the calculations. And so when I was done, I ended up with about 10.3 instead of the 11.4 or so that it actually is. And the mistake I made was, and we'll go through a few dimensions to explain it. Back to our thousand piston. There's a dimension we call the compression height. And the compression height is from the center of the pin to the crown. And it's not to, you know, the middle of the crown, it's to the outer edge or the lowest point of the crown, if you like. A piston will have a crown out here, and then it will either have a, a lump on it, like this one has a dome, or it'll have a dish in it, but the outer edge is like a, a defining point, and that's what, what the compression height is. So that compression height there is a given number. And compared to the ST2 piston, which has a 68 mil stroke, and this thousand has a 71.5 mil stroke, the compression height should be about 1.5, sorry, 1.75 millimeters difference because the stroke is 3.5 millimeters. And basically, longer stroke means the piston goes up a bit more and down a bit more, and the up and the down are half of the stroke increase. And that was my hope when I started on this, that we would end up with the thousand piston being basically correct for those cylinders. And it turns out it is, it's just bang on. It's the squish or the, the deck height with this piston is right on one millimeter, which is just great. But when I was measuring the volume of the crown, what I forgot was that there's a deck height and the deck height is how far the edge of the piston is below or above the edge of the cylinder and that is a setting that you get and you use that in conjunction with your head gasket thickness to work out the squish or on these two valve engines which haven't got a head gasket the cylinder head and the cylinder just are just a metal on metal join against each other the distance you want is from the top of the cylinder down if you're going for one millimeter which we've got that's great if it was say a 996 with a 0.5 mil head gasket then the deck height you aim for becomes you know between 0.4 and 0.5 to give to give you between 0.9 and one mil squish but i forgot about the one mil deck height so this is the setup i used when i was doing the piston crown volume measurement and this Bit of perspex seals the top of it up. This bar holds it down nice and flat. I actually had a couple of columns on here just to pull them down as well. Bit of grease in here and it seals up nice. So what I did was, you see the piston coming up now because the crown can't go all the way. But from top dead center, I moved the piston down 10 mil. And I called that 10 millimeters down. What I forgot was that the deck height is part of that. So with one mil deck height and 10 mil down, I actually had the piston 11 millimeters down the bore, not 10. And when you do the calculations for the volume, that extra millimeter with a 94 mil bore adds 6.95 cc's. And that 6.95 cc's makes a difference between 10.3 and 11.5. So as it turns out, due to my double inclusion of the, the squish clearance or the deck height measurement, which I had 
both in the volume here and in my calculation, I ended up with too much volume and that gave me less compression. Now we've got it that I know it's about 11.45, I think, by the numbers now. What that does is means a little bit too high. I would have been really happy with high 10s, but 11.5 I'm a little bit concerned about. So you about it. how can I get rid of some compression? And the first thing you do is, is machine the piston crown. So take you know, some dimension off this. And that crown is about 42 mil at its outside edges, that dome. So taking a millimetre off takes off a couple of cc's. So if I take two mil off, I should get back to 10.8 to one comp, which will be nice. But you can, your consideration when you're doing that is always how thick is the piston crown. And I was a bit concerned about that, but when I turned the piston over, you can see once a cast piston, it's not a forged piston, but that's okay, given how hard it's revving. But you can see that this section of the piston here, which is the underside of the crown, is the same as all this here in terms of thickness. And the actual crown section is about 12 or 13 millimetres thick. <laughs> so it's super thick. So there's plenty of thickness there to machine. So I'll take two mil off the top and we should have 10.8 to one compression. And it'll be really nice. This is my piston machining rig, which goes in the lathe. It's just a big piece of round aluminium. And the little circle you can see, which holds the piston pin, has a big long piece of threaded rod that goes all the way through the center of the lathe and out the back, which you then tighten down. And the piston gets pulled against the front of the big aluminium block. Usually I face the block every time I go to use it, just so you put it in and you take a skim off, and that way you've got a nice concentric surface for your next cutting. And often I'll machine the, you can see the ridges in the middle, or the raised bit in the middle. You machine that so that it locates the piston in whatever fashion the piston is machined to be located. And it looks like that. And so when you're just taking a flat skim off the top, the center isn't hugely important, but sometimes if you want to put a dish in a piston or you want to offset the dish or something, then you really need to have it located where you want it to be. And that's what two mil off the top looks like. In hindsight, if I was doing this again, I probably wouldn't machine the piston crowns. And that's just based on the fact that when I gave it back to the owner for him to run it in before the first service and before the dyno session, it was running an EEPROM that I'd made up, which was basically my normal ST2 EEPROM with some fuel added. And it was running a standard spark map from the what would have been the Ultimap uh, UM161, which my... BB161 is a version thereof. And I found the owner was running it on standard unleaded fuel, which I thought would have been a bit risky given the compression that was in it. But turns out ST2 EEPROMs don't have a lot of spark advance at wide open throttle at all. And so when it went to the dyno, it ended up with about four degrees more advance in places, I think from memory. I'll show you that a bit later on. But certainly it wasn't anywhere near as detonation sensitive as I was thinking it might have been. So if I was doing it again, I'd probably run it at 11.5 to 1, which will help the performance a little bit. Once you've got sort of over 10.5, you're not getting a huge amount more out of these. But once I'd machined the pistons, I sent it out to have it all balanced. Now this was a 1000 crank. It was the rods that came off the crank, because when we did the warranty repair at Moto 1, we would have put a new crank in the bike and a new set of rods. The bike that they came out of ran the big ends originally. The pistons are just some second-hand ones I got from Ed Millich, but once I'd machined the pistons, they were a little bit lighter, but two mil off the top is not a great deal, so it wouldn't have made that much difference. So I was fairly surprised at the amount of weight that came off the crank. Bill the crank man, as you can see, has put a few spots in it, which all adds up to a bit of weight, and it was particularly nice and smooth when it was all back together. So then I got prepped to go to the dyno and I modified the airbox lid. When I first did the, the base dyno run before I pulled it apart, I just took the airbox lid off and ran it without an airbox lid. 
then put it back on again, ride back to the to the workshop. But this is how it went out to run permanently. The reason I've left the front section is that the paper air filters are really good filters. I would use a paper air filter over anything else anytime I could. And the only reason you can't run a paper filter is if it's going to get wet. The ST does protect the front of the air filter really quite well, but I figured I'd leave the front bit there. That way it was guaranteed it would never get water in. I use paper instead of the aftermarket oiled cloth like a K&N or whatever, just because if you hold a K&N up to the light, you can see holes in it. So I really like the paper filters. And then it went to the dyno. This is before in red and a development wide open throttle run in blue. It would be a run, I think the EEPROM in this run had four degrees more advanced all the way through or through some of the, the range. Uh, it was a little bit rich at the top end, which is why the curve starts tapering down. It might have made another horsepower or two, and it probably would have held the power flat, much like the before run. It was limited to 8,500 revs, because that's where the 1,000 is limited. So I figured I'd just replicate that. And realistically, it's making its max power at a bit over 7. So you don't really need to rev it that hard, unless... You just love revving things. The max power went from 76 to 89 horsepower. And the maximum torque went from 54 to 70 foot-pounds. Which is a nice increase. If we go via the RPM, at 3000 RPM, it made about 14% difference. At 4000 RPM, it's 25%. At 5,000 RPM, it's 29%. At 6,000 RPM, it's 29% again. 7,000 RPM, it's 24%. And at 8,000 RPM, it's 16%. Now the spec of this engine was, before it was a standard ST2 with some stain tunes, the cam timing had been reset to 107 degrees some time ago, and it was running a my BB161 or 162 EEPROM, which is a slightly modified version of the UM161 that Dwayne sold years ago. In the after state, it has the 1000 crank, pistons and rods, has more compression, has about 10.8 compared to probably nine and a half ish that I think it would have standard. It has one millimeter over inlet valves and the heads have been ported. I also would have taken the weld ridge out of the exhaust headers at the exhaust port. And apart from that, there's nothing else really done. So it's a fairly minor sort of hot up. As you can see, it does give a nice increase. The cam timing afterwards, I think I was set at 108 degrees. It moved a little bit. The ST2 cams, in my experience, don't really make a lot of difference when you start moving them around. In terms of fueling changes, which people always want to see how much difference it made to the fuel map, this is the difference between the original fuel map and where I ended up. And full throttle is the column on the very left-hand end. So you can see at full throttle, it's got between, what's the least, minus 1%. At one point, minus 3.3. Well, 8,800 RPMs, it wouldn't have been changed, or it might have changed a little bit, but that's pretty much past where it was rev limited. And you can see even at 7,600, it hasn't really changed much in terms of fueling. So possibly the Ultimap EEPROM might have been a little bit rich up there anyway. But through the mid range, there's a 27%, 10s, 16. And that's the sort of thing you expect when you tune something like this. Often it just doesn't follow a set percentage increase. The red numbers across the bottom are throttle opening in degrees. And the blue numbers up the right hand side are RPM. You can see in the five, six and a half and eight degree throttle opening columns that at the lower RPM, which is where you're cruising around a lot, it's quite a bit leaner. And I did that because I just had the suspicion that this EEPROM was fairly rich in those areas. And getting it run on the dyno, both cylinders individually, 
you can see what it's like. I actually would have leaned out quite a bit more of the range, but it didn't like it in terms of roll on. And I tried playing with the acceleration enrichment table as well, which is meant to give an accelerator pump like effect that you have on a carby. Just add fuel when you roll it open quickly, but it just didn't really seem to function like it should. So in the end, at the sort of mid and high throttle openings, I would have taken some more fuel out there in places as well, but it just hurt the way it rolled on. It sort of gave it a flat spot or a hesitation, whereas the way it is here, it just rolls on really nice and hard. This is the Spark Advance at full throttle. It's not the same as Spark Advance everywhere. It's a 3D Spark table, so this isn't all over. This is just wide open throttle. The 1.6 ME Prom actually has a separate wide open throttle table, which I always make the same as the highest breakpoint throttle wise on the Spark table anyway. I don't know why they decided to put this extra line in. It's one of those things you see in, in the ECU files. Sometimes you see a table and you think, what's the point of that? It's just an added confusion. But obviously it might have made tuning them easier to get around knocking issues, that sort of thing. So this is full advance. Compared to the standard ST2 table, it's got an extra five degrees at 3,800 and 4,000 RPM. And from then up, it's sort of four, three, four, three, three, four, three, and the same at 8,800, which is past the rev limiter anyway. With that spark advance on 95 unleaded, it was really happy. No hint of a ping, just went like a train. And that's why I said earlier, I wouldn't machine the pistons again if I was doing this again simply because it just didn't seem to need it. Now, a lot long after it all went back together, it came apart again. When it was in bits originally, it had a fair bit of wear on the input shaft gears, which really surprised me for the, for the kilometres. It hadn't done that many kilometres to see sort of, you know, noticeable gearbox wear was quite strange. So I bought another gearbox and I did this about the same time as I had an ST4S in bits. And it got a gearbox as well because the output shaft was all rounded off at the sprocket retaining plate. And I know when I got the gearboxes in for them, just secondhand ones, good secondhand ones, I counted teeth on at least one of them to make sure it was the right gear set. And it was. And that was the ST4S as it turns out. The gearbox I got for this ST2 was a close ratio. And so when it went in, I gave it back to the owner and he said, it feels like it's missing top gear. And I thought, it's a bit strange. And then I realized what I'd done wrong. So I had to get it back, drop the engine out of it, split it, put a wide ratio gearbox in it, put it back together again, which really sucks. It's about four days of unpaid work, but I had to do it. So when it came apart, there was a little bit of staining on the top of the cylinder and on the head, as you can see here, just at the exhaust port which is where these things usually leak when they leak oil, when the heads warp compared to the cylinders. And the STs and the 906s and 907s have always had an issue where they will leak oil as the kilometers get high. And what it happens is the cylinder heads warp. And so they actually push oil out between the cylinder and the head because there's no head gasket on these engines. It's just cylinder on head with that stepper you can see. And Instead of leaking combustion gas, which they don't, they just push oil out. The STs and the 906 and 907 are water-cooled, and I'm guessing because of the water jackets in the heads, the heads just aren't as stiff as the air-cooled heads. You see this a bit with air-cooled heads, but usually only really high kilometer ones. So I was a little bit concerned about that, whether it meant it was going to give me problems in terms of leaking oil and stuff. But I spoke to Eric at Clubhouse Motorsports in the US. Eric has a lot more experience hotting up STs than I did he, at BCM with Bruce Myers. They used to do big bore kits and things. And Eric said he didn't think it would be an issue. It just It's showing a bit of oil maybe moving around, but not anything to really be concerned about. I'd be more wary of this on an ST in the future, maybe. I'm not sure that it would stop me doing it again, but an air-cooled engine might be a better candidate for this simply because the heads are stiffer. And realistically, I guess this is why the 1000 engines and all the other engines in the DS range or DS style range, 659, 696, 796, 1100, 
all have a normal multi-layer shim steel head gasket these days instead of just this metal on metal join. You can see that that's what the head looked like there. Just next to the exhaust port you can see where the cylinder and head mating surface is. It's a little bit darker just in a section there. So it has been pushing something past. It wasn't leaking oil as such. But the bike is coming in in the next month or so, I think, for a service that's done about 10,000 k since the hot-up work was done. So at that point, I'll get a good idea of how it's going. I was actually talking to Reid Herman a little while ago, and uh, Reid had done this himself years ago. So it's certainly not a new idea. And I was quite surprised how well it all worked in terms especially of the pistons. I was messaging Mark Sutton about something at the same time and I mentioned that I'd done this and how it went together like it was just made for it. The squish clearance with the standard base gaskets was about one millimeter which is just where you want it. It was just absolutely perfect. So certainly a very good mod, maybe more for an air-cooled engine than a water-cooled engine but it's easy to do. If you wanted to do it to a carbureted super sport which has a single phase alternator this ST2 was a 2001, all the injected super sports are three phase alternators. So doing it to a single phase alternator would require doing something about the alternator because the crank is quite different on the left hand snout on a single phase compared to a three phase. But you should be able to use a three phase alternator and then bolt a later alternator cover onto the carburetor model engine cases but you would lose the cylinder drain backs, which you could then drill holes in the alternator cover to take the cylinder drain backs, or maybe even try to modify your cylinders. I don't know if you can do that or not. I've never thought about it. But it's a nice mod.